Today I want to talk about artistry. I think it's a well ignored topic in classical ballet. Why it's ignored in my opinion is because it's a it's kind of not a teaching moment. You can teach technique, you can teach positions, you can teach how to, but how do you draw artistry out of a student? How do you bring it out of yourself if you're not a dance teacher? And it was really interesting. Uh, I had a live interview with Corps de Ballet Ondine has a wonderful channel over there. You should check her out if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Ondine. And we talked about artistry versus technique. And we were talking about the order of learning that. And I was saying that what I was taught and what I believe is the technique should be first. And I also referenced a post I put up, um, I guess about a week ago that said, when you learn uh, something incorrectly, a movement pattern incorrectly, it takes 3,500 times <laughs> to undo that habit. Whereas it only takes 750 approximately to learn a correct technique or a correct movement pattern. And that information comes from Lisa Howell of the Ballet Blog Official, another wonderful resource for you. I did a teacher course with her uh, level one about four years ago. I don't know where those stats are from, but I do trust Lisa and it, it's, it's you know, I think a valid concern. So what, what led me to feel and to emulate what my teacher said, the technique comes first, artistry second, is because I felt that if you overdo the artistry, by dancing around too much with your ballet movement, you might create a bad habit. But on the other side of the coin, if you never allow yourself freedom of movement, you become a robotic ballet dancer. And ballet is about self-expression within a construct of technique. And it was Natalia Makarova, the beautiful Russian ballerina that defected in 1970 to the West. I actually saw her dance that year at the San Francisco Opera House. I believe it was La Silphide or Les Silphide. I can't remember. But anyway, I just remember her floating across the stage and she was so gorgeous. And she partnered with many famous men, um, including Eric Brun. But anyhow, she said that technique gives you freedom. And that's how I was taught to believe. And that's what I think. If you're able to hold your core and make beautiful lines and turn with ease, you have good technique. Then that technique becomes your vehicle to express yourself in choreography and, or express yourself in class, even in your first basic plie. Yeah. Oh, thank you ballet for everybody. I agree. Great, it's not separate from technique. So that's what I was gonna to get to next. <laughs> it is part of technique. And when I used to teach small children, one of the first exercises I did from Royal Academy of Dance that I picked up and loved was we all formed a circle and we ran around in a ballet run at, and it was a great warm up. And kids have excess energy right when they're coming in from school and we did run 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 port de bra in a circle following each other curtsy so one two three four running five six curtsy seven eight turn and run the other way they loved it it was energizing and it was also working on technique and artistry we didn't work on perfect pointed feet perfect port de bra that came in the lesson but anyway there are ways to incorporate that we know as i'm sure you've experienced or you teach yourself my first basic uh, lesson in artistry when I teach is port de bras. It's the very first thing you do besides a proper stance is you take your arms and you move them from first to second and you start training. So important. I'm on my soapbox now. <laughs> that we take our eyes and they are like glued into the center of your palm. Right. And then the next one is allongé, not floating like this, but allongé, a lengthened out. So port de bras is super important to me. And I think it's expressive and builds, builds your foundation and it's tied into your technique, of course. You have to hold your ribs placed, you have to have your neutral pelvis, all those things in order to have a free arm. You have to learn to hold your shoulder blades flat. That's all the technique part. 
But once you get that structure, that basic stance, you are free to move, but don't move without your eyes. One of the different things about artistry, let's give an example, first arabesque pose. You tell to tilt your head towards your arm. Well, tilt could just be this. What I learned though was lift your cheekbone, lengthen your neck, and then I believe that's a much more artistic presentation, don't you? One, and there's a growth through the body. The bad technique would be to grow and release, right? We already have a technique in place. Now we do this. Now you could stand or sit, even just like I'm sitting right now, and work on it with the shoulders over your hips, core engaged, and develop that without really at risk of developing a poor movement pattern on your own. Because we are at home, a lot of us still, we don't have a hands-on teacher, we, we might want to practice things more simply. And yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. There's an order to doing things, but on top of it, first you must have the technique. And if you do too much too early, you get, um, you get those habits instilled. And that's my, that's my concern because I've received students like that in, in the years that I have um, you know, been teaching. So it was really interesting because I picked up this book that I really like and it's probably backwards, yeah, to you. It says The Art of Teaching Ballet, the 20th Century Masters. One of my favorite teachers is in here, David Howard. But you know, when I looked in the glossary, I just thought, well, I wonder what they're saying about artistry. It wasn't even in this extensive glossary in the back, which is kind of interesting, because I thought I'll probably find a nice, beautiful artistic quote that I can use. So I went ahead to Teaching Classical Ballet, Advanced Principles, John White, who I also admire. He had a really nice quote. I'm going to read it to you. Oh, well, here's a good one. The difference between art and sport. Sport requires you to give yourself to the goal of winning. Art demands that you give yourself to the process of creativity. So part of that creativity, of course, is getting your technique. I'm going to keep saying it. And then the technique gives you freedom and still along the way movement. So when I teach a beginning ballet class for adults, I don't make them stand in their stance forever and barely move because it's not perfect. Um, you have to interweave some nuances and artistry in what they're doing. They love to get the port de correctly, right? We all do. But adults are a different audience than children. It is different. And I like the differences. One thing I'll always do in adult class, I'll teach triplets first if they're really beginners. Then we gradually, or actually pretty quickly, turn it out. We add port de bras, we use epaulement, and then it feels artistic. And it's not, they're not doing anything incorrect for their technique. But I really do feel that you must interweave the sense of movement that becomes joy of artistry to your students without destroying the technique. So, to me, that doesn't mean putting on a tutu and going to your classical ballet bar and be inspired by a costume. It means taking the essential elements of classical ballet and working them correctly. Just wear your leotard and tights and look at yourself honestly you know, and you will progress a lot faster. If you want to throw on a skirt, I don't care. But I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying that there are outward things that might make you feel more artistic, but artistry comes from within. It comes from within and with good, precise training. And that's what a lot of these wonderful syllabuses are about. People have thought about this for a long time. In the arts, it's important to pay attention to trifles. Nothing is important, is as important as trifles, properly integrated at the right time. I don't know what they means by trifles, but when we're ready to put something in, which I would say self-expression, you know when you're ready and you will be encouraged to do it. If it distorts your placement, maybe you pull back a little bit, fix it, go back to that, that beautiful artistic moment, that your self-expression. So that's one of the key elements I notice in kids. When I was teaching full-time, I felt that children have that inherent sense, especially like 10 and under, of joy of movement. When they become a teenager, hi, Caitlin, you're a teenager. <laughs> and I was your teacher for a long time, right? Teenagers get embarrassed. They are more self-conscious. They're going through changes in their body, changes in their social structure. So they might have a little harder time with joy of movement than a younger child. Then you go into adults, who for many other reasons, maybe some similar ones, who don't let go again. 
So if we build a safe construct of artistry into our technique and into the bar that carries us into the center, we are going to be successful and still be artistic and technical in our presentation. So one of the key elements to artistry is musicality. So when you are in the center and you're going to do an adage, I always try to put forth a beautiful piece of adagio music. Sometimes I'll even use an orchestrated piece, which is a little harder because the counts may be uneven. But if that pulls you out of your space and lengthens your line automatically, you know your artistry is at play, right? A teacher can also do that in a reverence. So in reverence is the end of class, as you know. If we put on, you know, the music just inspires you so much. Let's just say you take something from the Nutcracker that you love. When I was a kid and dancing around in this very living room, my mother used to yell at me because I would be afraid I was going to knock things over. And it was the Waltz of the Flowers. The Waltz of the Flowers inspired me, right? Anything that gets you moving. But again, what do we say? Technique first, artistry second. Find the things that inspire you. If you feel like you're not very inspired and your well is shallow for artistic experiences, when your museums are back open, go to your museums. Watch wonderful movies. I watched a really great movie the other night. It was an old Catherine Deneuve movie. Uh, I forget the French word for it, but basically it was about a trophy wife. It was so funny, but it was rich. And you know, I thought, oh, if I was in a comedy ballet, I could take that, I could take that personality <laughs> and put it into that ballet. Because we have to draw on things, right? We have to draw on things to know. So we have all the arts to draw from. So keep your creativity alive so you can bring it into the classroom. Back to what my discussion was with Andine of uh, Corps de Ballet the other day. She's in, fr she's in France. So I said to her, prenez-vous pas la main. Uh, I wanted to be able to speak some French to her. And I put that quote up like two days ago. It means take yourself by the hand because ultimately you all are your own teacher. You know, um, I think that we have to be truth seekers for ourselves. Go to where you think the experience and the knowledge is like a hungry sponge and take it in. Stay there as long as you're still learning and gaining from that. If you feel you're, you're stalemate, look within, look at where you're at, and maybe add to it before you quit your teacher or your studio. But look to, look to that. But if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. So years ago, I was at a scholarship at San Francisco Ballet one summer, and I was put into advanced six. I'd only been dancing three years. I demoted myself. I went to the director, Harold Christensen, and said, I want to move down. And the reason I wanted to move down was because I felt, one, the class was too big, I wanted more personal attention, and uh, one teacher I couldn't understand at all, he was the character teacher and a famous dancer from Belarus, but, but anyway, I just wanted to go to another teacher to the level down. I didn't care what level I was. I wanted to learn. Now that's just my personal story and experience. It may not work for everyone, but I, I, I felt I got a lot more out of the experience being in a smaller group, going a little more fundamentals. I mean, I was getting steps and faking it through the advanced six class that I didn't even know yet. So I thought, what's the point of that? And no one, no one, uh, no one really criticized me or said anything. So, you know, sometimes you have to prenez-vous pas la main and do the right thing for yourself. Maybe that means adding, um, like today's post, I pictured myself in Sacramento Ballet way back, well, about the time I was on scholarship at Sarnsko Ballet, I went there for the summer. Of my sway back, I have a natural uh, sort of loose back and I go into this posture all the time, even with all my years of ballet training. I was always told, oh, you're so weak. And I didn't know what they meant and they didn't explain very well. Now I know what they mean. I needed to get my abdominals stronger, so I found progressing ballet technique, which you know that I teach now. Um, I'm a level three instructor. I've been teaching it, gosh, oh, four years? Yeah. Um, I did Pilates. I did that quite a few times, but I like Pilates a lot, but there's not artistry in Pilates. There's artistry in progressing ballet technique because every single exercise 
is set to music just like a ballet class. Everything is related to the ballet class. The way you use your arms and your fingers and your focus is just like ballet. Anyway, that worked for me and I find like, I really find my transverse abdominis, those lower abs right here that control the pelvis, boom, those have gotta be in to keep and then be free like I was talking about. So that's part of your technique is sometimes do extra things if you feel demotivated or you aren't progressing. Well, so you gotta interject some dancing steps to keep the artistry going, but not challenge, say, um, you know, our turnout or the way we hold our back, we lose our technique, or do a, do a pirouette and just land, flailing, because it felt so good. I would not say that's the way I would approach artistry. Yeah. Anyway, what is the name of the book? Okay, so I have two books here, Jill. One is called, and it's gonna be backwards, Teaching Classical Ballet by John White. Advanced. He also wrote another one, and there's he has a lot of quotes in the back. The other one is the art of teaching classical of teaching ballet, 10 20th century masters by Gretchen Ward Warren. It has wonderful interviews, highlights from these dance teachers, these ballet teachers actually uh, careers. But I was just saying, there's no uh, there's no artistry in the in the uh, index, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and the other concern, lastly, is. The emphasis on competition training. There are really good aspects to the Youth America Grand Prix, the Prix de Lausanne, different things. Helps, some of them are professionals, some are not. So if you get an award, it helps you have that achievement. Maybe a company picks you. And the, the younger one is to get notoriety as well. But because of that intense competition and they allow you to change or modify the variation to do the most difficult version, so you get more points. So then it ends up people trying to get their legs sky high. And in my opinion, some of those, some of those extensions are not artistic. And there is that concern in the ballet community about that. Um, sure, it's great to do five pirouettes, but what happened to two or three beautiful ones that land up and suspended? We will always strive for that, for example. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna sign up. But that's basically what I wanted to share with you. Just a, just a short view on artistry versus technique, the order, how to integrate it, and encourage you to be artistic, but don't sacrifice your technique. <laughs> All right. I'll see you later. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Bye-bye.